Good morning, Linwood. Welcome to worship. Whoever you are and wherever you are on your journey of faith, you are welcome in this community. You are welcome in this sacred time, and you are welcome in the unconditional love of God. My name is Jennifer Murdoch, and it is my privilege to serve as pastor here at Linwood and my joy to welcome you into worship. We pray that this period of time would offer rest for your soul, renewal, and strength for the week ahead as we are made new by the love and the presence of our God. Today is Thanksgiving Sunday. It's the first day in a week and a season of celebrating all of the blessings and abundance of life. It's also a time to reflect upon the importance of our gratitude and our generosity. One of the ways that we express our gratitude to God and the life that we've been given is through the sharing of all that we have. We do that through our regular offerings that support the ministries of this place, but we also do it through many special offerings that reach out to those most in need. This year, our Thanksgiving offering will support the work of the Alameda County Food Bank. This is always important work, but this year it is needed more than ever. So we pray that you would consider giving generously to our Thanksgiving offering, either today or someday throughout the week ahead. Another way that we express our gratitude is through our worship, our praise, and our prayer. And so I would invite you to join with me in a moment of prayer this morning. Loving creator, source of all that is, we have entered into sacred time and sacred space with you. Help us to focus ourselves upon your presence. Quiet our minds and rekindle our hearts. Lift our eyes from the concerns of everyday life so that we might see you shining among us. Help us now to sing your praises, to thank you and those around us. Give us hearts ready to love and hands that are ready to serve. Amen. Please join us for the opening hymn, number 2008, Let All Things Now Living.
Good morning, Linwood. I hope you are safe and well and experiencing some amount of peace this week, specifically the peace of Christ, which we pass to one another each week. And that, I believe, is a peace that tells us that despite hardship and death and loss and suffering and pain, there's hope that those things don't have the final word in our world, that resurrection is possible. And that's maybe hard to imagine right now, but I hope that we can experience some amount of peace with that, that on the other side of these hard things, life exists, life is still going, and life won't be stopped. So I want to wish you that peace, which is kind of a big audacious thing, and I hope you will wish those around you that same peace and that we may bring it in our world. So take a second to do that. May the peace of Christ be with you. While you're doing that, I'm going to invite the kids to gather around. Kids, how are you this morning? I hope you are doing good too. Let's talk about something. Let's talk about something that you have heard a lot about, and that is masks. Now, not these types of masks that we've been wearing all over the place. Not like that. That was a bad way to put it on. I'm talking about masks that we had before COVID. What were masks about before COVID? Like these types of masks. This is a mask that I got in South Africa. I traveled there quite a while ago and I picked this up. This is, I think, a Zulu mask. And masks can be for a lot of different things. But you know one thing that masks can be about and be for? They can disguise us so that people can't tell who we are. You know, Jesus tells a story about when he is in a disguise. Did you know that Jesus is in a disguise sometimes? Not an actual mask. He's not walking around like this. But Jesus is disguised as the people around us. Jesus tells a story and says that whatever you do, whatever we do to the people around us, we do to Jesus. And specifically, he says, whatever we do to the least of the people around us, we do to Jesus. Now, who do you think the least around us are? I wonder if it's the people that we tend to not notice or that we're scared of. Maybe the homeless person we walk past or drive past. Maybe it's the person that's hard to be around. Maybe it's the person who's struggling with pain and sickness and we don't know how to help them. I don't think Jesus is saying that anyone is actually worse than anyone else. But I think he's trying to tell us, you know what? Every single person that we encounter is just as important as Jesus is. So whenever we help those people, whenever we help each other, we're helping Jesus. And whenever other people help us, they're helping Jesus because we are all sacred and beautiful. So I hope this week we'll do that. We'll recognize that Jesus could be in a disguise somewhere. Now, maybe you can't actually get near someone and help them. But you know what you could do? You could give your money or your time. You could write a card to someone who's struggling, maybe someone in a nursing home. You could call a friend or a family member, member who you haven't seen for a while. When you do that, maybe you're helping Jesus in disguise. Let's pray. God, we thank you that you tell us that everyone around us is just as important as Jesus. That what we do to the people around us is what we do to you. Help us to see through these disguises that we sort of put on people and love them deeply like you do. Amen. Our reading comes from Matthew 25. Let us hear the word. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate people one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at his left. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, 
Come, you that are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food, or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you, or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. Then he will say to those at his left hand, You that are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not give me clothing. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, Lord, when was it? that we saw you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you. Then he will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life.
The great preacher and teacher Frederick Beekner once wrote about a surprising and emotional moment that he and his family experienced when they were on vacation at SeaWorld. He wrote this, we shed tears because that day we had caught a glimpse of the peaceable kingdom and it had almost broken our hearts. For a few minutes we had seen Eden and been a part of the great dance that goes on at the heart of creation. We shed tears because we were given a glimpse of the way life was created to be and is not. Joy is home. And I believe the tears that came to our eyes were more than anything else, homesick tears. That's how it is when we catch a surprising glimpse of the kingdom of God, isn't it? It feels so familiar, even though we know we've never experienced it in all of its fullness, at least not yet. It's a feeling of coming home to all that we were meant to be and all that the world was meant to be. Almost anything can spark it. We can feel it as we watch a bird fly in the sky. We can feel it as we witness the final descent of the sun sinking below the horizon. We can feel it as we hold the hand of someone who is grieving or hear a song or say a prayer. Anything can spark it, but the response is always the same. A flood of joy, a flood of peace, a sense of hope that there is more to this life and that somehow the more of life compels us to also be more, more than we currently are and all that we were created to be. Over the last few weeks, we have talked about the kingdom of God, Jesus' most fundamental teaching. More than anything else, Jesus believed that God was inviting us here and now to step into a new reality where his way would reign in our hearts and our minds and lives, a new way of relating to ourselves and to God and one another. In Jesus' kingdom, there is peace and grace, forgiveness, mercy, and trust. Today we turn to one of my favorite passages of scripture. It's Jesus teaching about the fundamental ethic that guides the kingdom of God. It's also a teaching about what God values the most. In it, we see a God of mercy who is fundamentally concerned for those who are lost, those who are lonely, those who are marginalized or hurting in our world. We also hear with absolute clarity the mission of the church and the calling of the children of God. We're called to feed the hungry, to give drink to the thirsty, to welcome the stranger, clothe the naked, care for the sick, and visit those who are imprisoned. I love this scripture, and every church that I've ever served has felt it was a clarion call to action. But in our do-gooder, change the world zeal, I wonder if we really grasp this scripture. This is a parable of judgment, after all. It appears in a series of parables, all about judgment, and all of them are rather harsh. It begins with the story that Sam preached about several weeks ago, a story about foolish bridesmaids who did not adequately prepare for the coming of the kingdom. And so they weren't ready. They were asleep when the groom came to that party that we know as the kingdom of God. It continued with the parable of the talents, a story of how much each of us has to share in the kingdom and what will happen to us if we hide the kingdom away and don't share it 
and watch it grow. Today, Jesus talks about the importance of caring for the lost and the least. But the judgment upon those who don't is just as harsh as in the preceding parables. The goats who fail to care for their neighbors, those who fall asleep and miss the kingdom party, those who hide the kingdom away and don't share it, all are thrown into outer darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. It is a pretty harsh consequence. If you heard the sermon a couple of weeks ago, you know that I believe Jesus was speaking with hyperbole here. He was speaking to religious leaders who he believed should have known better. And he used hyperbole to help all of us rise to the occasion to give more credence to the priorities that God has for our lives. We don't have to believe that Jesus is literally calling for eternal damnation into outer darkness for those who fail to heed this command. God's judgment is always filled with mercy and grace. We don't have to take this scripture literally, but I think it's important to take it seriously. Imagine that there is a time of reckoning when all of us will be asked to account for our lives. Look at how God will evaluate us. Look at what matters most to God. Because my sense is that it's not what matters most to us. Jesus says that we will not be judged on how much money was in our bank accounts, how well our portfolios performed. We won't be judged on our vacations, the size of our homes, how trim our physiques were maintained over the years, or how well and how long we held off the ravishes of time and gravity. We won't even be judged on the kinds of religious criteria that most of us have been taught are so important. Jesus never suggests that at the end of our lives, God will ask us to give an account for our orthodox Christian doctrine. God doesn't ask, did you accept Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? Did you attend worship each week? Did you refrain from drinking excessively, using vulgar language? Did you stay faithful in marriage? No, these things are important for a life of integrity, no doubt. But the question Jesus says will ultimately define us is simple. Did you care for those in need? If you did, you cared for God. If you didn't, then you didn't really do much for God at all. Jesus is not calling us to a new kind of works righteousness. I think he's asking us to look at our hearts and our motivations. The ultimate mark of our devotion to our Lord is how we respond to the neediness and vulnerability of our brothers and sisters. And I have to say, sometimes we respond in very different ways. Sometimes we respond to neediness with harsh criticism, with judgment, with anger and resentment. Sometimes we look at people in need and we say, I've managed to take care of myself, so what's wrong with you? This happens to all of us sometimes. And when we're in that place of indifference or anger, Jesus simply calls us back to the grace that we've all received. Sometimes we respond a little bit differently. Sometimes we respond to the neediness and vulnerabilities of the world with an absolute zeal for charitable giving. And this isn't bad, of course it's not bad. We are called to serve others. But there's a potential danger in it. And the danger is this, 
that sometimes in our zeal to do good, we can fail to really see the people that we're serving as full human beings. They end up as more supporting characters in what really matters to us, the big drama about us and how good and charitable and giving we are. Matthew 25, though, isn't meant to fill us with self-importance. It's meant to fill us with humble gratitude for all that we've been given and all that we have to share. We are blessed to be a blessing, absolutely. But we aren't the blessing. The blessing is God and God's grace. And that is true for every one of us, whether we are the one who is thirsty or the one who is offering a drink. Maybe that's Jesus' point. At the end of our lives, as in every moment of our lives, every single one of us kneels before the throne of grace. There is another way to respond. The way that Jesus responded to us when he was here among us. And that way to respond is with empathy, compassion, deep understanding, as we sense our oneness as brothers and sisters, as children of God. Jesus says in this passage, I was hungry and you fed me. So where is Jesus in the story? Most of us hear the story and we immediately think, wow, I have a great opportunity to go out and meet the needs of others. I get to be Jesus for someone else. But Christ's presence is not embodied in those who go out to feed the hungry. Christ is in the hungry being fed. Christ isn't the one who comes to visit in prison. Christ is the one imprisoned. There's an important distinction here, though, and I want to thank Nadia Bowles Weber for her wonderful interpretation of this passage. She writes that we aren't called to romanticize those who give as perfectly charitable any more than we are called to romanticize those in need as perfectly humble. Christ does not come to us as the poor and the hungry. Christ comes to us in the needs of the poor, the hungry, the lonely, forgotten, and misjudged. Needs that are met by another so that the redemption of God can be known. All of us are in need of that redemption, aren't we? None of us earned this gift of life. None of us ever earns the forgiveness of God or another. That's the point of redemption, that our needs are fulfilled out of the goodness of the giver pure and simple. In this life, none of us gets to play Jesus. The job has been filled in and for all time. We are all bearers of the gospel and we all receive it. That's the glorious blessing that we share together. On this side of the veil, it comes in those tiny glimpses, those little tastes, but it's enough, enough to keep us reaching for who we're meant to be and the world as it may yet be, a world where every need is met with love, every person is valued, where every heart beats with compassion and every hand serves with care. The fundamental ethic of the kingdom is not charity, Charity implies a distinction between those who have and those who have not. And that distinction is not real in the kingdom of God. What Jesus wants is for us to be so filled, 
so filled with his grace and mercy, so grateful for the life we've been given and the hope of all that is still possible, that we offer that same love and generosity to others, just as it has been given to us. And it's in that moment, in that moment that we understand our shared human need. And we give and we receive that the kingdom comes in our midst. In this week of Thanksgiving, I'd invite each of us to reflect upon those moments in which we have caught glimpses of the kingdom of God. Notice how you felt in those moments. For me, they usually come in the midst of everyday life. They can be as simple as a moment of running at sunrise and being touched by beauty or watching my children learn something new and being inspired by hope and the wonder of being human. Sometimes they do come in extraordinary and profound moments when I've been privileged to watch someone take their last breath and to honor that person's life and memory and prayer with the family. Moments of service and mission when despite barriers of language and culture, we're suddenly singing the same song in different languages, all praising God together. Whether your moments are ordinary or extraordinary, whether they're like mine or very, very different than mine, I know our responses are much the same. They are thanks and giving. When we know, when we know deep down inside that none of us earns this banquet feast of life, none of us does. And yet here it is laid out before every single one of us. The only response to that is thank you. And how can I share it with someone else? That's the grace of the kingdom of God. So keep on seeking it. Keep on sharing it. It is the promise of all that we will one day be. It's that love that allows us to see Jesus in that man walking down the street in tattered clothes with everything that he owns on his back and to not run away in fear or judgment or just a sense that we don't have the time. But instead, we can look him in the eye and say, hey, how can I help you find a good meal? Amen. We're going to enter into a time of prayer with one another. If you are watching our worship service on YouTube today, we'd invite you to um, log off YouTube as worship ends and join us in Zoom fellowship so that we can share joys and concerns together. If you are on Zoom already, then you know that we'll take this time after worship to share some joys and concerns before we enter into fellowship time with one another. I am aware of some joys and concerns among the body that I would like to lift up, particularly prayers for those who are in need of some healing and grace for Carol Rooley, Anne Emery, Carol McGregor's son, who is a second year medical resident who has contracted COVID, um, apparently from a patient that he was serving, and also prayers of healing and recovery for our office manager, Raylene. Also in this week of Thanksgiving, we wanna be mindful of those who are in need, those without shelter, those without family, those who may be seeking extra help to provide the meal and the celebration that they would like to for those that they love. Let us hold all of those prayers and those that are known only to us in compassion and grace as we lift them up before the Lord. Let's join together in prayer. God of all blessings, source of all life, giver of every good gift, 
We thank you for the gift of life, for the breath that sustains us, for the bounty of the earth that nurtures us, for the love of family and friends that shapes us, for the wonder of the universe that delights us. We thank you for communities, for families who nurture our becoming, for friends who love us by choice, for companions at work who share our burdens and daily tasks, for strangers who welcome us into their midst, for people from other lands who call us to grow in understanding, for children who give us hope for the future. We thank you for this day, for one more day to give and receive love, for one more day to work for justice and peace, for one more day to experience your presence, for one more day to know you as God with us and for us. For these and all blessings, we give you thanks, eternal and loving God. Amen. Please join us for the closing hymn, number 102, Now Thank We All Our God. Friends, go into this Thanksgiving week with your eyes open, ready to catch a glimpse of God's kingdom that is coming, your hearts open and ready to be swept away in joy, and your hands open, ready to serve with generosity and care. Hear these words written in Colossians chapter 2. So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. Go in peace and serve our God. Amen.